WCON 1170 Radio and Star Vision Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We Should Know is on the air. We're coming to you on WCLN Star Vision Channel 16. Tuesdays, 2.30 to 3.30 each and every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on Star Vision Channel 16. We're pleased to be here today. Wonderful topic we're talking about, kind of disturbing in a way. We're going to uh, get to that in just a second. I want to quickly give a shout out to some folks that listen to us out there. Uh, Constantly having folks either to email me or call me or they'll see me somewhere and say, I've been looking at your show. And I'm always surprised at the, at the number of people that started picking up this channel and listening to some of the subjects we have on. I want to mention Steve Wiggins out in the Keener community of Sampson County. I saw him the other day. He said he'd listen to the show as well. And, of course, I always uh, kind of mention uh, Ed Causey, our county manager, ever so often. Not only has he been a guest, uh, Ed listens to the show and kind of keeps track of what we're doing. And I encourage you guys to keep giving us some advice and direction on what you think about the show. Today's show we're talking about a subject that's really uh, interesting, uh, to some degree devastating. Uh, we just have seen, uh, in, unfolded in the national news media, a horrific situation in Cleveland uh, where folks were held captive for a decade. Uh, females in a house held captive for a decade. Today we're fortunate to have with us the author of the book on human trafficking, Jennifer Fisher. Jennifer, you're with the North Carolina Justice Academy. Department of Justice, actually, which is the education arm of the Department of Justice and Justice Academy. You've trained law enforcement officers for a number of years now. You are a law enforcement officer here in North Carolina, certified officer. It's good to have you. Uh, we want to kind of bring you back into the picture and talk about human trafficking. And, and I open with the thing in Cleveland. Uh, it's so heart-wrenching and horrible to imagine people held against their will in a home and subjected to the kinds of things that we saw and everybody, I guess, that had a TV, unless you were under a rock, saw this happening uh, and, and verbalized uh, clearly for a decade, 10 years, multiple births, uh, brutality. Give us a segue in from there to human trafficking and the book that you have written on that and, and how, how your life has been absorbed with this to some degree. Well, thank you for having me on the show this morning. I appreciate it. Um, the, the incident that occurred in, in Cleveland was no more than modern-day slavery. These girls were, were held for over 10 years as sexual slaves to their captors. And here we are 2013, and we still have slavery in existence. Um, it, it's interesting that this has made national news because this is a crime that's occurring all over the U.S., to include North Carolina, both sexual slavery and labor trafficking, mm -hmm. sex trafficking mm -hmm. and labor trafficking. Uh, North Carolina has been rated the eighth of having the most human trafficking in the country. Mm -hmm. um, some of what credits North Carolina to that, to that ranking is our large agriculture industry here in North Carolina, uh, as well as our seasonal tourism. We have beautiful beaches and beautiful mountains where we bring in an influx of, of seasonal temporary employees to, to help um, with the housekeeping of the, the condominiums and the hotels and the restaurant work and the souvenir shops. So we have exploitation that's occurring here in our own state, um, just like they are in Cleveland, um, in both labor trafficking and sex trafficking. So when we look at, when we look at a situation like Cleveland, and, and I know folks have asked the question themselves to themselves or maybe to others, how could it be that someone lived next door and literally from looking at the newsreels, it looked like 15, 20 feet to the next house. How could someone live that close to a house, to a neighbor, so to speak, and this kind of thing, people held against their will for a decade. We're not talking a few weeks, we're talking a decade. We're talking multiple births, we're talking brutality. Uh, it, the more that's unfolding in this thing from, from a law enforcement perspective is just astounding. How could that be? And, and could somebody, hypothetically, in eastern North Carolina be living near uh, a situation of the same kind? Absolutely. These types of incidents are occurring in both rural America and urban America. Um, it's happening in the, the, the country and it's happening in the city. It, it's 
it's happening in residential neighborhoods just like yours or mine. Um, it could be the next door neighbor that we never see what happens behind closed doors. Just like in the early 90s, 80s and 90s with domestic violence, mm -hmm. domestic violence was an issue within the home and that was held behind doors, not for the public to see. This is very similar in the same type of movement where awareness is just being increased and people are just starting to learn what human trafficking actually is and what to look for as far as the indicators. When, when you looked at this, and what was the first thing that kind of, uh, and I hesitate to use the word intrigue because it maybe the better word would be horrified you enough to cause you to want to really get involved in this because you've done work with the on the federal level with uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney and other folks in understanding and looking at the prosecutorial part of these kinds of things. What intrigues you to said, you know, Jennifer, I want to get involved in this kind of program. What said to you to do that? Well, my law, my own law enforcement experience sent me down that path. I started in my earlier on in my law enforcement career investigating child abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence cases and I could always see that there was a, another component that I couldn't figure out exactly what it was. You knew you had that that feeling where the hair stood up on the back of your neck but you just couldn't quite see what it was. So I started doing my own research several years ago um, which led me to want to take all the information that I gathered and, and combine it and put into a book, into a manual that made it easy for other officers to learn about human trafficking. With that I began teaching classes and developing courses on what those indicators are, what it is that the officers need to be looked for because this is something that could be right in front of us and we never see it if we're not looking for the right things. One of the things you mentioned in, in the education point uh, with law enforcement people, North Carolina is known nationwide for its, uh, I guess, leadership role in training and education of law enforcement. North Carolina Department of Justice, the arm of that in North Carolina Justice Academy, uh, makes uh, a huge statement as to the dedication toward law enforcement training in North Carolina. You guys develop lesson plan upon lesson plan over there. Uh, this particular program uh, that you look at in the book on human trafficking, in fact, entitled Human Trafficking, trafficking uh, and particularly kind of a guide for law enforcement. As you looked at that book and put it together, did you sense that there maybe would be some folks to go, we really don't need that in the law enforcement community or uh, maybe that's not really happening here because it was kind of cutting edge? Absolutely. It was a term that a, a lot of law enforcement officials and community members weren't familiar with. It wasn't dinner talk. It wasn't something that you talked about. Um, so as we were able to respond to the inquiries about what human trafficking means and ha give out give a better definition of what that actually means what it is that they, they need to look for you could see the light bulbs begin to go off of the need for the training for their officers in July 2011 a new block of instruction was added to the basic law enforcement training curriculum where all new people becoming police certified law enforcement officers in North Carolina would receive that training and that entails a, what human trafficking is, and B, what to look for, and C, what to do with the information once they receive it. Now, in your book, you delineate between two different types. You have the human trafficking and then a term called uh, human smuggling. Uh, the, the criminal activity as it relates, uh, we kind of see it as one big basket, but there's two different kinds of uh, laws that's violated. They explain the difference for us in those two areas. And that was something I really kind of struggled with when I first learned about that because we're in North Carolina. We don't, we don't border any other country. So how did we have smuggling here all the way at the East Coast? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, the Highway Patrol received a phone call. This was several years ago outside of the Charlotte area where there was a van full of immigrants, Mexican immigrants, coming into the Charlotte area. And they were supposed to stop at a truck stop to deliver a van full of young Mexicans. And when they got there, and the Mexicans had agreed and paid a, a certain amount of money to pay the coyote to bring them here to this truck stop just outside of Charlotte. When the driver pulled into the truck stop in Charlotte, he told the, the people riding on the bus that you are going to have to pay me some more money, that it was a little bit more difficult for me to, to get you here, so you're going to have to make some more, bring me some more money. Of course, the, the passengers on the van had no more money. They had saved all the money they could just to come to the United States from Mexico. So he said, well, I'm not going to let you get off the bus. I'm not going to let you get off the van. But I have a farm where you can come and work off the, the, the difference in money, and I'll provide housing for you and food for you and, and work for you on the farm until you can pay off your debt. 
Well, at that point there was no choice. So the term, the, the, the agreement of human smuggling to be smuggled to North Carolina, to be brought to North Carolina by that coyote, that agreement ended when they no longer had a choice to get off the van and were being coerced and forced to come work at, at the farm by the, the trafficker itself. Um, so one of the passengers on the van had a cell phone and called one of their relatives that was there to pick him up. And they called 911 where Highway Patrol came and intercepted the van and performed a traffic stop and was able to rescue those individuals off the van. Interesting story. Now you mentioned the term coyote. It, it, define what we're talking about because a lot of folks may not understand what the that entails when we hear coyote. Of course we think of an animal but that's I guess to some degree we might parallel that as well with that. Coyote would be an individual that they would come into a voluntary contract with to pay them X amount of money to bring them from point A to B, whether or not that be from Mexico to Texas or Mexico to North Carolina. Um, but it's a voluntary agreement between two people. Um, you can voluntarily be smuggled. You cannot voluntarily be trafficked and exploited. So the voluntary part of being smuggled is that a coyote, meaning a person that makes it happen, that actually carries through with that, is that a person from another country that brings folks here, no matter whether it's uh, Mexico or whether it's uh, you know an uh, Asian country or wherever it may be, that person is termed a coyote, so therefore they're responsible for getting to this country. Yes, and they could be of any nationality. They could be from Mexico or they could be just across the U.S. border and, and be a U.S. citizen. Now typically in a smuggling situation, none of these people have passports. Typically they do not have passports and very many times the coyote will collect any type of identification documents that they do have. Um, basically almost in holding those for ransom. Um, so that way the individual is not free to leave and if they do leave, they would not have any documentation to support their identity. Unbelievable uh, kinds of things going on right here under our nose. We're, we, and again, we're going to take a break and uh, continue to talk about this when we come back, Jennifer. And I want to thank you again for being here. So let's, let's take a quick break. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break. You're listening to We Should Know. Uh, we thank you for tuning in today. If you've got a friend out there you want to call, we're talking about human trafficking, actually modern-day slavery. Stay with us. We'll be back. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching We Should Know on WCLN 1170 Radio, Star Vision uh, TV, Channel 16, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 7 p.m. on Channel 16 and Tuesdays, each and every Tuesday, 2.30 to 3.30. Thank you for tuning in today. I want to give a shout out very quickly to all those folks out there with the uh, radio station that constantly mentions their name. And we'll start with uh, Robert Stroud, Boogie Shoes, Wayne Weeks that does the Gospel Hour. Uh, also, uh, the, the crowd that meets in the morning there at the radio station, the morning gang, I'll call them that. I uh, want to thank them for, for mentioning us as well. And of course, the Fly Tommy uh, that does the program in the afternoon, and Nicole. All of those folks uh, and the country store, Don Smith, uh, you guys, we really appreciate you mentioning the program and letting folks know what's going on. We're talking about human trafficking today. We're talking about slavery. Jennifer Fisher's with us, the author of the book on human trafficking. Jennifer, the number for the uh, National Human Trafficking uh, Center is 1-888-3737-888. And I'll repeat that again, 1-888-3737-888. And if you punch all those numbers in, somebody's going to answer the phone, right? Somebody's going to answer the phone. Okay. And that's what you recommend folks if they've got information or believe something's going on to call that number first off? I recommend if it's a information that they can provide that they suspect that there's a potential victim of trafficking or if they have a request for training or a question about it. Now I would definitely recommend if someone is in an immediate danger to call 911. But if they're not in immediate danger that they can provide that tip information to that number. You know we live in a society and, and folks typically don't want to get involved or they tell themselves they don't want to get involved. What are some of the kinds of things that and, and, and we'll use kind of as, I guess, a backdrop, the Cleveland situation that everybody's so familiar with right now. What are some of the things that folks may have, and of course now we see things that they have seen, they reported some of it, and we'll talk about that, but what are some of the things right here in our area, in eastern North Carolina, that folks may look at and say, there's something unusual going on here, that they may want to call that number and just give them the information. Say, I'm not sure, but that just looked a little strange. What's some of the kinds of things they should look for? Well, if you have an individual that's controlling the movement of other individuals, whether or not that's one person or a group of individuals, or 
as not allowing the other individuals in a group to, to communicate. They're acting as a spokesperson for those people. Um, if you have a group of individuals that have poor hygiene or don't appear to, to be I don't know the best way to put it, but not able to attend to themselves for personal hygiene purposes, whether or not they're being provided the opportunity for that or not. Um, especially in our, in our area with our large agricultural industry, the groups of Hispanic workers or migrant farmers that we have um, that harvest the crops that we have here in North Carolina, the top three crops that are handpicked in North Carolina, cucumbers, sweet potatoes, and tobacco. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are a few of the indicators that you can look for um, and, tr and call somebody to report that information. When you call this number, uh, a person answers the phone or do you get a, you know, press this number or press that number? Is it in both English and Spanish? They have it, um, multi-language barriers, is different callers to, can call in different languages. You can also make anonymous reports and tips as well. One of the things you point out in your book as well is that over 60 percent of the folks that, uh, that you're seeing involved in this, in particular in North Carolina, over 60 percent are Latino by, by uh, birth or what have you. Is, is that still true or has there been some changes in that since you wrote that book? Uh, there have some, been some changes. The data collection um, processes have changed a bit. We have seen some other nationalities here in North Carolina as victims of, of trafficking as well. Um, to include Afghan, um, Bosnian, South Korean, Chinese, Mexican, um, and Salvadorian. So we're seeing a, a, a more than just Latino mm -hmm. ethnicities. The whole trafficking issue, the difference when we talk about trafficking and, and, and you look at situations where folks are held captive for years over, over time, for example, decades, what's the, what distinguishing human trafficking from what we saw in Cleveland and is there points that are they're the same thing? Um, there's a few different elements that, that you have to prove when we're talking about human trafficking and if they're an adult the the components that we have to show are that either force, fraud, or coercion was used. Force meaning okay I can physically put my hand on your shoulder and move you but I can also psychologically force you to, to do something or to get up and move. Um, whether that be through threats of harm to yourself or threats of harm to your children or threats of harm to your family, wherever, whatever that may be, I can physically or psychologically force you to, to do something um, against your will. So the second element would be fraud. I could fraudulently, I could lie to you, say, you know, yeah, I'll let you off the, uh, the van at the truck stop in Charlotte and lie and then change my story to force you to come and work for me on my farm. Um, the third element is coercion, trickery. Are they coming to America for the American dream? Is that American dream, what are they getting when they get here? Um, many times foreigners come to the U.S. looking for the American dream and don't always receive that. That's not to say that we don't have domestic trafficking victims as well. Um, what we're seeing in numbers here in North Carolina is about half and half, half foreign, half domestic, meaning U.S. citizens being the victims of trafficking. These victims, when, when they come here, there, there is, I think, possibly an expectation, at least at some point, unless they're kidnapped in another country and brought here. Oftentimes, as you mentioned, they come here looking for certain kinds of possibilities and opportunities. I'm often, it's obviously it's going to be a question that many folks out there is going through their heads. Why don't, if there's one person and you've got 10 or 20 other people uh, that are there and they're being held captive. You've got one person she referred to as a coyote. Uh, there's obviously opportunity that they could run or leave or run somewhere and report it. Why don't they do that? For a lot of the same reasons that domestic violence don't leave their, their batterer, the, the psychological coercion, the fear of leaving, the not having family or friends or a support personnel to go to to help them in that time of need, not possibly being here of legal status, so they fear deportation if they were to go to law enforcement. Um, everyone has their own reason as to why they stay in a situation like that or like domestic violence, but those are some of the 
reasons. When we see the trends changing, now, where are we at now when we look at ourselves as far as North Carolina in the country as it relates to immigrants and as it relates to traffic? And I know we're pretty, we're pretty high up there on the scale of, of immigrants in North Carolina simply because of what you just said, the number of workers we got in hotels and various other industries uh, that are from uh, either some of our Latin countries uh, to include Mexico and others. Uh, what, where do we rank on, on the United States and the United States as a state comparatively? We are number one in the United States for the number of H-2A visas, which means temporary visas to come into the United States. So I think that is from our large agricultural industry as well as those seasonal tourism employing, employment opportunities. So we're number one as it relates to the legal process yes. of coming into North Carolina. Number yes. one. Number one as far as the legal process, and the FBI rates us as number fifth in the United States for immigrant population. That includes both legal and illegal status. And when you look at that and, and look at the population of North Carolina and compare it to places like California, New York, other states with large, I'm talking huge numbers uh, of people, uh, that says a lot for North Carolina. It, and this manual labor that you talk about, this, this sense of doing something uh, that is a box moving kind of industry, that's what's attracting folks here? Well, a lot of migrant farm workers will come to, to make money to send money back home to their families um, in, in the country that their origin is may not be as fortunate as what they are here in the United States. And unfortunately, they're being exploited because they're, whether or not they're here legally or illegally, they're wanting to make money under the table to send back home. So they're being exploited for their work on, on within our agricultural industry. I'll give you an example. In the sweet potato industry, a farm worker would need to, would to be paid $50 in collecting sweet potatoes. They would have to pick up two tons of sweet potatoes to make $50. Now, they pick them up in bushel size buckets and they are paid 40 to 45 cents a bucket. And that would be approximately 35 pounds of sweet potatoes. That's going to take them about 17 or 18 buckets just to make the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, which is what our federal minimum wage standard is. So for, for them to make the minimum wage, they've got to do that, those, that many buckets within an hour to meet the minimum wage requirement. Yes. So, do, do these folks work for the coyote when they're out there, or who do they work for? Uh, who actually disseminates the money? The coyote that's brought them in, or just somebody else? The coyote's contract is typically over whenever they've made delivery of the, the individuals involved. Um, the trafficker then, the trafficker is the one that maintains control over the individuals and ex actually exploits them through labor or sex trafficking. Um, I know I've spoken about labor trafficking quite a bit. This today, but sex trafficking is also very prevalent in North Carolina. About half of the cases that we're seeing are sex trafficking mm -hmm. to include minors engaged in prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, I spoke of the three components of human trafficking if they're at an adult, if the victim is an adult. If the victim is under the age of 18, we do not have to prove for force, fraud, or coercion, just that, that, just that they were involved in a commercial sexual act. So that's an effort under our law to protect our juveniles, anyone under the age of 18. Um, Backpage.com, we're starting to see prostitution is changing with sex trafficking being the focus. Prostitution is changing, whereas at one time you saw a lot of prostitutes walking up and down the street. Now you're finding them on the internet on Backpage.com or Craigslist or something of that nature. Um, is so. it that easy to, to have somebody under control that you do that kind of thing to and to get by with it for years as we've seen in the news for even a decade? I think the Cleveland, Cleveland case is a perfect example of how the, the psychological and physical control can you can maintain individuals, maintain control over another person. So you think we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg when we're looking at that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, we're going to go to another break, and, and we're going to come back and talk a bit more about that part of the trafficking that deals with the sexual behavior and what happens there. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching We Should Know. You're listening to us on WCLN. We're talking with Jennifer Fisher on human trafficking. We ask that you call a friend or neighbor, tell them to tune in. You might want to record it, and we'll be back in a moment. 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we should know it's on the air. We're talking about a brave new world, a dangerous world we're living in. We're discussing some of the issues related to the Cleveland horrific situation there in which uh, just this past week some ladies were found, some young women found in a home, been kept for a decade. We're talking with Jennifer Fisher. She literally wrote the book on human trafficking, modern day slavery, if you will. Jennifer, you've done quite a bit of work on this subject. You teach law enforcement people. North Carolina Justice Academy, part of the North Carolina Department of Justice. Uh, you've worked with the federal agencies on human trafficking. Uh, it's, it's still hard for a lot of folks to get their head around that uh, this large number of people that you've talked about are being held against their will. They're being uh, used in various situations. You mentioned some of the job-related things that oftentimes you find some of these folks in. But another area that uh, we're just getting into here to discuss is the whole area of uh, human trafficking as it relates uh, to, to this sexual uh, kind of area. What are, what are we really seeing happening there? And what kind of hierarchy is occurring? Is this is this where we find folks that have three or four people and they just do it? Or is there a larger kind of uh, organization where you have levels of people involved in this? This is a very organized crime. Um, this is a very networked crime where traffickers are networked with one another and from town to town where they will trade girls, um, trade them so that they, they keep different, have a variety for the for those that come and seek the services of those girls and boys. And this is a crime that not only includes girls, females, it also includes males as well as adults and children. Um, you mentioned asking a, a, about children in, in regards to sexual trafficking. Mm -hmm. The average age of a runaway is age 12. And research has shown that within 72 hours, that juvenile at age 12 will be exposed to prostitution in some form or fashion. Research also says the average entry age into prostitution is between 12 and 13. So whether or not that's a correlation, you can draw your own conclusion. Um, but research shows that the average age of runaway is 12, and between 12 and 13 can be entered into prostitution. So we're seeing um, more cases identified with domestic minor sex trafficking, with the victims being under the age of 18. Um, prostitution has changed, like I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, where it's, it's moving off the streets and into the technological era where the crime has changed, the evidence has changed, the techniques have changed. Well, walk us kind of through this. I know in your book, one of the things you mentioned there that, um, and, and looking at different cases that you've looked at over, over time, uh, that for $5,000, for example, and, and this is kind of hard to even put out there because it's just totally uh, dismantling to think about, but for $5,000, you buy a girl. And once you buy that girl, you mentioned in your book that it does not take you long to recoup your money and start making money. It's almost as if it's a capitalistic kind of uh, investment and you're purchasing uh, some device or something. And you, so you just start saying, well, okay, you put them on the web. What, what do you do? How does that work? Uh, and and is a, do you, does the person that buys this person um, I mean, how do they know that the person's for sale? How does all that happen? It's kind of put it together for us so we can get a, a picture of how it comes together and walk us through that process. Well, studies have shown that the three most profitable criminal enterprises in the U.S. is drug trafficking, gun trafficking, and human trafficking. Drug trafficking, a drug can be consumed and the drug is gone one time, so it can be sold one time. A gun can be sold half a dozen, dozen times, a couple dozen times over the life of the gun. Think about how many times a human being can be sold over and over and over again. The money to be made is in human trafficking and that's what the criminals are learning is that this is a, a multi-million dollar enterprise. Now the scary thing for, for, for me as I listen to you and of course you and I have talked quite a bit over time on this subject but it, it, and it still tends to you know kind of uh, raise the hairs on, on my arms as I think about this. A person is bought, they're sold over and over again and then they're subject to be sold to do certain acts and the owner still own that person just as they would if it were a horse or a dog or something else. That person is still owned so then you bring the person back and then you send them out and it's with prostitution and other things, they're sold for a period of time and you come back. So, but here what I'm hearing is that these could be people that are citizens of the United States, has been here for years, it's, was born and raised here, and their families is here, and all of a sudden they disappear and, and they could be 12 or 13 years old and they show up somewhere on a website. 
And that's what we're seeing in the national news, for instance, like the Cleveland or other mm -hmm. individuals kidnapped at a very early age and found 10, 20, 25, 30 years later after they've been held captive their entire lives and coerced and tricked into believing one thing or another as far as being brainwashed. Um, it's happening on a national level, it's happening on a state level, and it's happening on a local level. Shania Davis trial is, is, is going on right now in Cumberland County, mm -hmm. not far the way the crow flies from here, Absolutely. Um, where a mother was alleged to have sold her five-year-old daughter to pay off a drug debt, mm -hmm. where the drug dealer then took the five-year-old daughter and sexually assaulted and murdered her. That trial is going on right now as we speak. And that's a, an example, just one example of many that's out there. There's, there's other examples, in fact, one recently in the Harnett County area, as I recall, where there was something on Craigslist where a baby was for sale. They just literally had put on there and said, give the information, and I think that was covered on one of our uh, state uh, news channels. And, and those kinds of things, we don't, we don't really uh, associate that with human trafficking and the results of human trafficking. But the horrific part of that, as you're pointing out, is there's a process involved. So the people that, that own these girls, that they talk back and forth, and are there uh, younger than 12 or 13 girls that are literally put into this business? I would absolutely assume so. Um, the, the most horrific part of this industry is the younger, the more money the more the trafficker can charge for the services. It wasn't until 2007 that we had laws against trafficking here in North Carolina. And it wasn't until December 1st of this past year that we had a law in the book that says we cannot possess or purchase or deliver a minor, which meaning selling the individual as a human being, not necessarily just the services of, which is what the 2007 law said is that we cannot sell sexual services or labor services of another individual. Um, just a couple months ago, with the new legislation, is the new where uh, the unlawful to possess, purchase, or deliver a minor. So this, these things are unfolding before our eyes. Let me let me hasten to ask you this question: If you could speak to that uh, age bracket, of, let's just say ten and up girls now if you could speak to all of those girls out there and who knows what you know who may be listening to this show today or watching this show or what they know or they don't know if you could speak to girls today in that age bracket what would you tell them preventative wise if if you had to say to them look here's some things you need to adjust yourself to in modern day society and understand and number two if by chance uh, if by chance somebody has a radio on somewhere or they hear this and they are in a captive situation. Let's cover both of those angles right now. I want to give you a, a couple of segments there to, to speak to that because I think that's a critical issue and, and really where we can help bring this home to folks that really need some help and assistance. What would you tell them to do? If someone finds themselves in a situation and they feel as though they're being exploited through force, fraud, or coercion, I would definitely encourage them to, to seek out help, whether or not is if they have the opportunity to call 911 and just hang up, or if they have a friend that they can call or someone that they can go to to, to ask for help, I would always encourage that. Of course, um, they will, have, will want and need to do whatever they can to protect themselves from harm's way. At no point would I ever want them to place themselves in harm. Um, but in ever, whatever subtle way that they can ask for help to do so. Um, the help is there. Um, the, the training is there. The, the officers are there. The services are there. Whether or not they need help, whether or not they're of legal status or not, if they're a victim on American soil, they are a victim of a crime. That does not mean that they will be deported. They will be treated as victims and be provided the same type services that anyone else in that, that would be a victim of that type of crime, whether or not of American status or not. Um, whether or not that be food, shelter, um, clothing, whatever that may be, that those services are available and ready for them. Um, to the young girls out there, if, if there's individuals out there that are flourishing them with gifts and, and, and jewelry and clothing as though they're um, gloating over them and wanting them, especially if they're of older um, age, grooming them, recruiting them, um, I would be cautious of that, this, those types of behaviors. Um, of course, staying in groups if they're out and about in the public. Um, mm -hmm. And just keeping a support group. And 
Are there things, Jennifer, that we should be doing in schools to talk specifically to this target population without creating, we already live in a society of some sense of paranoia, I guess, and I certainly don't want to push that any further, but is there things we should be doing in schools to talk to our young uh, females now to say, look, you know, you folks are really targeted and you're highly vulnerable. Is, is there something we should be doing there? There are programs available that they, can, that they can request in the schools to come out and talk to the students of the schools about indicators to look for and about safety for themselves. Um, we're, we have also at the state level, I'm on the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Tra Trafficking Executive Committee, and we are working on an outreach program strategic plan to offer training for school personnel, whether or not that be the counselor, the teacher, the bus driver, the, the coaches, whoever that may be, as well as many other professionals like uh, EMTs, garbage truck collectors, um, anyone that may come into contact with a potential victim, whether or not mm -hmm. it's through the rural America or in the city. Mm -hmm. So anybody that, that has a impact or connectivity in any way, whether it's seeing something as a, a person picking up trash in the trash that may indicate that, uh, or somebody that's a school teacher and there's, as you mentioned earlier, uh, somebody a bit uh, rumpled or not uh, taken care of or they show up at a school, that could be uh, a target issue as well. The school bus driver that may be going out to these labor camps where the migrant farmers are, are living and whether or not they're living in substandard housing. What we're seeing a lot here in North Carolina is that the, the housing has no air conditioning, no heating. Well, we're going to take another break and we'll come back and try to, to put some more uh, meat on these bones talking about human trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking about human trafficking with the author of the book on human trafficking, Jennifer Fisher. We'll be back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're talking with Jennifer, Fish, Jennifer Fisher, the author of the book on human trafficking. I'm going to hold this book up uh, so you can get a shot of that. I want you to see that the uh, cover of the book, the title of the book, uh, you might want to just go to Amazon.com. You can pick the book up there if you want to do some more reading on it, specifically for law enforcement people as kind of a guide. It's very informative as you look at the book uh, as it relates to the general population, but I would encourage... Uh, uh, people who's involved in law enforcement and criminal justice community to definitely get this book and pay close attention to it. Jennifer, again, thank you for being here and uh, taking time to talk to us. We talk, we've talked in a number of uh, different angles about human trafficking, and we've talked about it in uh, various aspects, but I know there's uh, several things that we talked about. One was runaways, uh, substance abuse, alcohol abusers, people that are addicted folks, uh, and mentally ill folks. Let's talk about it from that perspective. Uh, somebody that's addicted to a controlled substance of some kind, whether it's a prescription drug, whether it's a, an illegal drug, uh, are they easier to get into that market of, of sex slavery, should I say? Well, J.W., when someone's addicted to some type of substance, controlled substance, people will do almost anything to get more of that controlled substance. So many times they, they target the substance abu abusers or any other type of vulnerable population, whether or not it be the mentally ill that maybe not have a full cognizance of what types of behaviors they're actually engaging in, whether or not they're um, of legal or illegal status, um, as well as the elderly being exploited um, for their lack of understanding or whatever the reason may be. Um, someone that may be going through some type of natural disaster could be exploited. Think about the tsunami that they had and if you were to lose your entire home and everything that you owned and you have a family to provide for. If someone came in and offered to take your children and, and provide for them until you could rebuild your house, you know, a, a, a good moral parent would, would consider that to be a viable option for them. Um, so do we have natural disasters that happen here in North Carolina? Absolutely. We have tornadoes. We have hurricanes. Um, unfortunately, we do have natural disasters where people could be vulnerable populations to be exploited. Same goes for our illegal immigrants that are in our country. Again, it's another vulnerable population that lends itself to being exploited. People that do not have an identity in this country, as you just mentioned, the illegal immigrant population. The vulnerability they have is that they do not have a reporting mechanism. They, they are held not only captive, but even if the door is open, uh, they feel totally uh, inept to be able to go out and report anything because they know they're illegal, they know they don't have any sense of citizenship, 
And so therefore, they even if the door's open, they're not going anywhere. Right, and they've been told by their traffickers over and over again, if you, if you go to anyone, they're going to deport you and send you back home. Um, another example, I think, to, to demonstrate that is, earlier I mentioned that we are number one in the country for the H-2A temporary visa holders here in North Carolina. Um, that visa is tied to only one employer. So if that person were to feel as though they were being exploited and wanted to report, if they make that report uh, of potential trafficking of their employer, they're unable to transfer their, their job status to another employer. Mm -hmm. So that could affect their ability to stay in the United States to work. And that's for those that are here of legal status. Mm -hmm. Going back to the illegal, illegal status, um, they don't feel as though that they can report to anyone. And many times the country where they have come from, law enforcement is corrupt. So they may or may not trust the government here as well. That's a very good point, and, and, and you've mentioned several times the, the agricultural community, and of course we've got a, a lot of folks listening to this show that, that drives green tractors, red tractors, blue tractors, mostly I think green and red, but, and, and they, some of these folks will see me out in the, in the community and they'll say, yeah, I heard you, and, and they heard me when they were working, they were on their tractor and they're, you know, they've got radios and these things now like I didn't have a long time ago, and they'll listen to the program and I appreciate them listening. What would you say to those folks, because I, my sense is, is that they're not going to be involved in this kind of thing, but specifically for folks in the agriculture business, what are some of the cues that, that they need to watch for? I mean, other than the obvious, you know, somebody pulls up with uh, 10 people in a van and they, they don't have any kind of papers and they say, we'll do whatever for you, just give me uh, $1,000 or something. What, what are other kinds of things they should look for that are signs? Sure. Um, their, their ability to be able to maintain their own identity documentation. Um, instead of one person having a, a rubber band wad of everyone's driver's license mm -hmm. or, or birth certificates. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, the, the psychological coercion of not allowing them to speak on their own or translating for them if, it, if there's a language barrier there. Um, the, the controlled movement, not allowing them to, to go certain places without supervision or even allowing them to go without supervision, the, the psychological methods of control that we talked about earlier. So all those would be indicators to look for. If, if somebody pulls up and, and they're in, they drive up into the, the, the area to go to work and all these people get out, are there certain behavioral traits that they have that somebody can look at and tell that they're just kind of, uh, to, to coin a phrase, I guess, to be beat down, they just look like they're not going to be able to hold their head up to look at you or something. Is there any things like that that would be indicators? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because there is one cultural difference with many of the Latino communities, mm -hmm. and that's making eye contact. Mm -hmm. uh, the American culture says basically that it's disrespectful for us not to make eye contact. We sit here and, and talk today absolutely. and we're making eye contact. It's an indicator of honesty it's for it. us if we look somebody in the eye. Absolutely. There are some communities and cultures across the world to include some Asian cultures as well as Latino cultures that it would be disrespectful to force them to make us look, mm -hmm. at, look us into the eye. And that's something we lack on our side is understanding their culture. Not to say that one's right or one's wrong, um, but that is a cultural difference. So that is not necessarily an indicator if someone won't look you in the eye. Right. Um, one indicator that would be indicative of trafficking or one individual controlling another would be looking to the other individual before they speak, basically for confirmation of what they're saying is the right thing. Um, the, the fear from that person, just as we see in domestic violence mm -hmm. victims sometimes looking to the batterer before they answer to make sure that they're saying the right words that the batterer wants them to say. Cover stories, um, that the trafficker stories that they have told the victims to, to say to the police or to the farmers when asked certain questions. Other than the abuse that would be relatively obvious, uh, which would be the abuse that comes with sexual abuse, those kinds of things to these uh, victims, what other kinds of abuse are they experiencing? Uh, is, is there beatings, floggings, is there something that goes on that uh, tortures of some kind that, that you're discovering that happens to these females as they are held captive? Um, we've heard of stories of being held captive by, by chains to, to doors, locks on the outside of some of the labor camp doors, so not allowing them to be able to leave the residence at night. Um, 
many times we've seen physical barriers to control them, but oftentimes we've seen the psychological barriers of them not feeling as though that they could leave, whether or not that's through threat of harm to themselves or others, whether or not it's because they have seen someone else be beaten that they fear by seeing the other person beaten that if they do the same thing that they'll be the next one to be beaten. Um, so physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, all of the above. So when, when we look at, at this process and, and we see these uh, potential uh, folks that's in a van, are they moved from one location to another? They may be in eastern North Carolina one day and, and somewhere in Virginia the next day. Or uh, is, is that the kind of thing we're seeing? Or are they moved to a certain location and just held there for years, unlike what Cleveland, you know, Cleveland, they were there for a decade. Sure. These folks are on the move constantly, are they not? Uh, most of them. There have been incidents where someone has been trafficked in their own home and, and not been allowed to leave, like the Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, recent Cleveland case. Oftentimes they are moved um, from town to town, city to city. As soon as one crop may be finished, as far as harvesting, moved to another um, town or another farming area. Um, so me, uh, there have often been times where victims don't know what town or city they're in at the time whenever people have gotten out and spoken to them. That should also be an indicator. That Absolutely. So folks listening now, I want, to give, I want to give this number out one more time. This is 1-888-3737-888. You can call that number for tips of information. Folks that are listening, maybe they have church groups. I know you've been out to a number of church groups and spoke, civic groups, that kind of thing. Folks want to hear more about this. Can they call you and say, you know, do you have time to come out and speak to us? Is that something you do, or is there another number or other organizations that does that? Absolutely. They can call me, and you can, I can give you my contact information. Um, my phone number is area code 910-525-4158, extension 236. Um, I make presentations for community personnel, school personnel, church personnel. You name the target audience, and I make presentations to, to all of those groups and be more than glad to do that. And continue to teach law enforcement people. So all of those folks out there that listen to our show that are law enforcement officers right now, if they have not had a good dose and understanding of this, they also need to contact you and say, hey, we need to get something at our department for the officers in this department, correct? Absolutely. We have online training available as well. And I have traveled across the, the state as well as other states and other countries to provide training on human trafficking. Very quickly, and, and touch on this if you will, that, that group of people that we talked about, that, that age group, 12 to 13, 12 to 14 group, those, those young uh, adolescent females, uh, there seems to be a gap there. Uh, if somebody's interested in contacting you to do something in their school to help develop a program for that age group, they should also call you. Yes, please. I'd be more than glad to do that. These are the kinds of things I think folks want to know. We, you know, and we've tried to lay out here today uh, for our uh, viewers and listeners this huge, horrific problem. And I think you've brought it home to us. Anything you want to add as we go to closure today? Um, just to, to make that phone call if you suspect a victim of trafficking and speak for those victims that are silent and unable to speak. And the key is they're silent, unable to speak, and they're going through a terror like nobody can imagine and uh, you know th uh, you know thank God for folks like you and others that are willing to step up and be a voice for these people uh, and thank God for those law enforcement officers out there in our community uh, yourself and, and many of us that are willing to stand up and and say something on behalf ladies and gentlemen you've been watching we should know today we've been talking with Jennifer Fisher the author of the book on human trafficking we encourage you to stay with us and continue to give us that message on what we should know and what you should know. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question or comment regarding this or any episode, please send your email questions and or comments to jwsimmonsedu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday afternoon beginning at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.